Hi, this is Mark from LongIslandWatch.com, and today we're looking at the Seagull 1963 Air Force Mechanical Chronograph. This watch was originally released in 1963. They re-released it in 2013 as a 50th anniversary commemorative. It comes in five different styles, as you can see here. Three in a 42 millimeter case, which are these three down here and two of them in a smaller 38 millimeter case. So let's dive in and get a closer look at each one. Here we have the 42 millimeter version. It's 42 millimeters in diameter without the crown, so that's from here to here, from the 2 to the 8. It's 15 millimeters thick, and from lug tip to lug tip, which is here to here, is right around 48 millimeters. Now the watch is a mechanical wind-up watch, so it's not an automatic. You must wind it about every day to day and a half to keep it running, as I'm doing right now. It will reach a hard stop when it's done winding, and when you feel that resistance, you stop winding because you don't want to snap the spring. It's got two pushers on the right. One starts the chronograph, stops it, and then resets it. We'll get more into the movement later, and we'll take off the watch back and really you know, see how it operates. It's a very clean design watch. Hours and minutes, of course. Chronograph seconds are indicated by the large red seconds hand. We can start the chronograph by pressing this button at the top, and the, the hand starts moving. Running seconds are always running as long as the watch is wound on the 9 o'clock register or subdial. And then on the far right is the minutes register for the chronograph. So after one minute, after this hand gets all the way back to 12, this hand will index one point. After 30 minutes, it will just keep going around. So it's a 30 minute counter. On the dial at the top, you have the red star, symbolic of 1963 China. Right under it, you have 21 Zhuan written. That is Chinese for jewels, I believe. And then at the bottom is in Chinese characters. It speaks about the uh, the manufacturer is the Tianjian Watch Company, which is we also know we also know as Seagull. So if we watch when this second hand comes all the way to the top, watch this register over here on the right, and it clicks over one click. Stop the chronograph and then reset it. The minutes counter and the big red second hand will snap back to zero. It's a very mechanical movement. You can you can hear it, but you can feel it when you use it. I mean, you're, you're moving a lot of gears, cams, levers, springs. It's amazing what, what they did in 1963. The movement is a Seagull ST19 movement. It is more or less what's known as a Venus 175. Venus was a watch movement manufacturer um, that was in business at the time. And they came out with chronograph movements. They made the Strela movement and they made this Venus 175 movement and then you can read about it on the internet there's a, a lot of history behind it but basically in the 50s or early 60s they sold all the tooling equipment to China so China could manufacture their own watch so the movement more or less is a Venus 175 but it is wholly made in China um, wholly made in their factories and there are many ST19 movements there's a 1901 and 1902 and they have different registers. Some of them have a third register down here for a 24-hour hand, um, but it's a it's a workhorse movement for them, uh, and it's been around for over 50 years. So again, just a, a real treasure just to activate and deactivate. You really feel like you're doing something mechanical. So the watch dial, we call it this cream dial, but it's really more of a, a lightish kind of a gold color. You can see it catches the light nicely. The numbers are these applied gold numbers and indices. So it comes in this cream color. This is the white dial version, also known as the panda dial. I guess because it looks like a panda bear. And it's got silver applied markers on the white dial. Same watch though, same case, same everything. Just really a different execution of the hands. The hands have some, some loom on them now, and dial color. And here is the black dial version. Same watch, just different, different colors on the hands. These are silver hands. 
silver applied indices and numerals on the black dial. Here we have the 37 millimeter version, 37 millimeters in case diameter, around 14 millimeters thick. And what's interesting is lug tip to lug tip is around 46 to 47 millimeters. Now it's a full 5 millimeters smaller in diameter than its larger brother, but lug tip to lug tip, you can see they've kind of lengthened the tips on the smaller version a bit. So while it is a smaller watch by, by a large margin when you look at it in this dimension, but from top to bottom, lug tip to lug tip, it really is very close. So it wears like a larger watch. Now this is more authentic to the original version. Back in the 60s, watches were this size. So they've made the 42 millimeter size to kind of be more modern, but this is the true size of the original. This one has sapphire crystal. The other ones I showed you before, I didn't mention it, these have mineral crystals. This is regular mineral glass. This one has sapphire, so scratch resistant and get all the benefits you get with sapphire. Very nice, you can see slightly domed, not so much, just a bit, but it really helps, helps the dial play nicely. Blue hands. And then there's another one, they're twins. This is actually an acrylic crystal. Same watch again. The only difference they've done here is they've changed the crystal and the dial appears to be an ever so slightly lighter shade. I don't think it's a trick caused by the crystal. I think it really is a lighter shade. And if I hold them side to side, you can see that acrylic crystal. This is more vintage. This is more tr now. This one's more true to the original in size, and it's using an acrylic crystal, so it bubbles out a bit. So that adds a couple of millimeters to its overall thickness. Also, being acrylic, you could buff it out if it were to get any scratches. So a lot of people ask us what the what the dial color of this one in my left hand is and again it's tough to describe it's it's kind of goldish but I'll hold it up against the other two if I can do if I can do that kind of a trick and you can kind of look at them all side by side the 42 millimeter is definitely the deepest color or definitely the most golden these two are slightly lighter but the middle one I would say is the lightest of all and I don't think it's a trick of light I think it's I think it's an actual color differential they all come on NATO straps. The smaller ones are on 18 millimeter olive green straps and the larger 42s are on 22 millimeter straps. This black and khaki and then the other two come on the black and red that you saw before. Here I've taken the watch off the strap so you can see what it looks like on the back. You have a nice transparent case back so you can see the movement and we'll take the back off in a second and you can really get a good look at it. But there's a bunch of characters written around it, number, um, serial numbers, 2013, which is the 50th anniversary year and the 50 note signifying that. So let's dive in and get a better view of the Siegel chronograph movement that powers the watch. Here I've removed the case back and you can see the entire movement. It's quite complicated. I'm not a watchmaker. I can't take it apart and put it back together, but I can certainly look at it and understand, you know, mostly how it functions. Um, but just some, some key parts. You got a balance up here. That's what basically the heart of the watch. It's what keeps the beat going. And you can see down here a balance spring, which is, it's a wound up coiled spring. It goes in and out, pulsates. Uh, there is a regulator up here. You can kind of see a plus and minus etched into the bridge. That's for making the watch slower and faster. There's a whole bunch of gears, levers, cams, jewels. So these are the jewels that people talk about often. You can see the jewels over here. There's many of them. They are uh, synthetic rubies. And of course you can see blue screws. You know, 
in a whole bunch of different places. And blue screws are generally, uh, you know, they're fancy. Uh, in more expensive watches, blue screws are thermally blued, which is a process used to harden the steel, and then as they cool it down, uh, it attains a blue hue. It's very difficult to do. It's very laborious to get all the screws the same color. Uh, in this case, they've cheated and they use a, a lacquer paint on the screw heads to get them to look blue, but the effect nonetheless is stunning. So when you wind the watch, which I'm doing with the crown, you can see it's winding the spring via this gear. There's a, this is the main spring barrel, and there's a, a wound up spring in there, and you're basically powering the watch, storing up its energy. Uh, another important part of the watch is right down here, this gear. This is, the, this is why we call it a column wheel chronograph. This castellated gear has a whole bunch of little towers on it. And its job, when you, when you activate and deactivate the chrono, this gear spins and also allows and rejects various levers in and out. And that's what starts the chrono, stops the chrono, and eventually re resets the chrono. So the watch is obviously always running as long as it's wound. These gears are always moving. But this gear itself actually translates. It moves over to the center wheel. This is the wheel that controls the center seconds hand or that chronograph counter. So when you engage the chronograph, I'll show you. Let's get in on it first. When you engage, you'll see that wheel will move up into that center seconds wheel. And now that center seconds wheel see if I can get my tool in there, is moving. And then when I disengage it, that wheel will stop moving because it will disengage from the wheel below it. Pretty nifty. And then only when it's stopped can you reset the chrono because the reset lever can now be admitted into the column wheel. If you tried this, you know, I'll run the chrono, I can't reset it. I'm pressing the button, I can't reset it because this notch of the reset lever can't be admitted into the column wheel. It's in front of one of the towers. So I have to actually act, deactivate the chrono. So now that reset lever, when I press it, it's going to snap right into the column wheel and that just reset the movement. And the movement's reset with a cam. It's a, I believe it's a heart-shaped cam and it snaps right back to zero. After 60 seconds of running chrono, the minutes counter will index one notch. So as discussed earlier, this is a 30 minute elapsed time chrono. Uh, so it, the minute hand will move once a minute. So let's see the minute hand go. Watch this minute right there. Boop. See it just popped over, it moved over one notch, and that corresponded to the elapsed minutes hand, sorry, the, that corresponded to the elapsed minutes hand going over one click. And likewise, when you stop it and reset it, that will snap back also. It's quite an impressive feat that they put all of this into this small package, and they did it 70 years ago, 60 years ago, without computer-aided design, without computer-aided analysis. This is all done pen and paper, and what we would consider non-advanced manufacturing techniques. Very difficult to do. Very difficult. Lots of moving parts. Got to keep friction down to a minimum. It's quite impressive. Chronograph movements are, you know, next to tourbillons, probably one of the most complicated movements out there. So in conclusion, whether you go with the cream dial 42, the white dial, black dial, or either of these 37 millimeter versions, you just can't go wrong. They're all really nice. They're sporty. They're dressy. Um, all around great watches. Thanks for watching guys. Again, if you have any questions or comments, sound, sound off down below and I'll be sure to answer anything you toss at me. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.